Welcome to Influence Church. This is our Saturday night live stream service. I'm so glad that you joined on. I'm so glad for all of you that are part of our Influence Church family. Those that are visiting and just clicking on for the very first time, welcome, welcome, welcome to Influence Church Saturday night service. We're about to get into a time of worship and today is a very special service because today is our communion service. So welcome to the month of June. Can you believe it? Six months in 2020 is already coming to a completion. And boy, it's time flying fast. But God is doing miracles and we're thankful for all that God is doing. So today being communion service, I'll, if you didn't have the opportunity as yet, why not prepare uh, some bread or cricks or something of that sort, biscuit and some wine. Um, by wine, I mean non-alcoholic, of course. So if you have some grape juice, if you do have any um, grape juice, uh, bring some water in a cup. Jesus is in the business of turning water into wine and we're going to have communion. So I want you to prepare that now as we, if you haven't as yet, have it close by. So after the preaching of God's word, we can partake in communion where we commune with God and we draw closer to God. So thank you for doing that. So while you're organizing that, while you're organizing the communion, if you haven't as yet, I also want you to grab your Bible and grab a notepad, okay? And of course, get the entire family around. If there are any distractions, turn off the distractions, turn off the television, turn off the um, stove, whatever it may be, and let's get ready to enter into time of worship. As we've been doing for the last couple of weeks, God has been teaching us to worship through our, or by our spirit. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus said to the woman of um, the woman at the well that there, there is coming an hour where God is looking for true worshipers, those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And now is that season. This is that season where the true worshipers would arise. And worship is from our hearts. Yes, the instruments and the vocalists, they create an atmosphere for us to worship God. But we got to be able to worship our hearts. And the sermon today is going to even delve a little bit more into that. So gather the family, gather your, um, gather even if you have um, tenants around, you know, send him a, a message that church is about to start, let them turn on their tele their, um, their cellular device to influence church. And if you haven't done so as yet, why not click that share button so that more people that you know can be blessed by God's word this evening. So once you've done all of that, let's grab our Bible and let's turn to the book of Psalm. And we're going to Psalm 63 and we'll be reading from verses 1 to 8. So Psalm 63 verses 1 to 8. All right. So once you're there, why not type Amen in the comments? So once you're there, Psalm 63 verse 1 to 8, type Amen or type um, Psalm P -S -A -L -A -L -M, P-S-A-L-A-L-M, Psalm 63, and we're beginning at verse 1. It says, O God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water, so I have looked for you in the sanctuary. Now we know that today it wasn't so dry and thirsty. There was no lack of water with the raining conditions that we had today. But here we see David describing that that desire for water in a period of drought is how much he desires for God. And this evening, as you set your heart on God, I want you to have that same desire that David had, where you just desire God. You just want more of God tonight. And in verse 2, it continues to say, So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory, because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Because you have been my help. Has God been your help right now? Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. These are the words of the psalmist, giving praise unto God. And actually, if you look at verse, if you look at verse 3, 
It says, because your loving kindness is better than life. And I don't know if that rings a bell in your mind, but that verse is a very popular lyric to a gospel song because it's from the Psalms that they got these words to pen in their lyrical content for the music that is used in worship. So the Psalms are praises unto God. It is worship unto God. So this evening, as you've guarded everyone around, I want to invite you to stand. I want to invite you to lift your hands and to lift your voice and to take a moment to really magnify God, to take a moment to bless God, to take a moment and say, God, your loving kindness is better than life. I'm so grateful for the cross. I'm so grateful for life and life more abundant. I'm so grateful that my home is in heaven for the rest of eternity. So as you lift your hands, as you lift your voice, let us welcome welcome God's presence into your home. Let us welcome the Holy Spirit into your house. Heavenly Father, we welcome your presence. We welcome your Holy Spirit now into our homes. Let our homes, God, be a sanctuary for your spirit to dwell in. Let our homes, God, be church right now. Let there be a shift in the atmosphere in the name of Jesus. If there be any depression, if there be any spirit that causes hatred and anger, whatever, whatever heaviness might be in the atmosphere of the homes of your people. We rebuke it now in the name of Jesus and we invite the presence of God, the Spirit of God into our homes. For where the presence of God is, there is fullness of joy. Where the presence of God is, there is liberty. Where the presence of God is, there is peace. There is joy. There is love. So Holy Spirit, you are welcome now into our home. You are welcome into our place of worship. Like David said, we desire you, God. Our heart longs for you. As the deer panted for the water brooks, so does our soul long it after you. In a place of desertness and dryness and wilderness where water is earnestly seeked for, we earnestly seek for you, God. You are the living water that is able to quench our souls, that is able to revitalize our spirit. God, we long to be like a tree that is planted near the rivers of water, that bears season that bears fruit in every season God so God we desire to be connected to you we desire for our roots to be connected to living water to be connected to heaven so Holy Spirit fill the atmosphere now God we bless your name we magnify your name Oh God, we honor you tonight, God. We bless your holy names. Our mouth shall sing praise with joyful lips unto you, God. We just magnify you. Why not take a moment right now with your hands uplifted to just give God a note of praise from your heart, from your lips. Let him know, God, I'm thankful for life. I'm thankful for your loving kindness. I'm thankful for breath. I'm thankful for strength. I'm thankful my family is alive. I'm thankful for finances. I'm thankful for food. I'm thankful for your blessings, even in this place of a lockdown and the state of emergency and this global pandemic. I'm thankful, God, that you've kept me. I'm thankful, God, that you and you alone have been my shield, my source, my strength. I thank you, God, for where I am weak. Your grace is more than sufficient. It's more than enough. I thank you, God, at where I've messed up and where I've sinned, you have forgiven me. You sent your son Jesus to die for me, to shed his blood on the cross for me because you love me. And I thank you for that forgiveness. I thank you for that grace. I thank you for salvation that I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was heading to a path of destruction, but now my feet are on solid ground, heading to a path that leads to life and life more abundantly. Why not praise him? Lift your hands, set the atmosphere, set a note of praise in your home right now. Let the atmosphere be filled with worship in your home from your hearts to heaven, from your spirit unto the spirit of Jesus Christ, unto the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Let that praise echo in your home. Let each person that is in your home now just lift up and glorify the name of Jesus. For where his name is lifted up, all eyes will be drawn unto him. So Holy Spirit, you are welcome into our homes now. Jesus, we exalt your name. We bless you, Heavenly Father. We give you all the praise that is due unto your name. We give you permission now in our home to move, Almighty God, to speak to our hearts. Let your word, God, transform our minds. Let us, oh God, have a refreshed perspective. Let us, O oh God, have a filling of your Holy Spirit that brings strength to carry on in this season. So we thank you, God, for what you're about to do in our homes, in our hearts, 
and the people that we love through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Why not give God a clap? Give him a clap. Why not send type a clap emoji in the comments and just give God a note of praise. We bless his holy name. I want to say once more, welcome to Influence Church. It's our Saturday night live stream. I'm, uh, I'm expecting that by now you are ready to hear from God's word. And we're going to get into God's word just in a few moments. This evening is the first time I could honestly say that I am really glad that we are having church online. Because usually when I hear church online, yes, um, I, I'm, we're doing church online and we're connecting. But I will admit that there is some level where I would much rather be in person. But today, today I can say with full confidence that I'm glad that we're doing church online because with the inclement weather over the last couple of days and with all the flooding in our country today, especially, you know, there would have definitely been um, some hell back to us having church in person. Maybe we might have had to cancel service because of flooding. I'm not sure. But for sure, our attendance would have dropped significantly. So I'm glad that even though the rain is falling heavily, that we can all be in church tonight. There is no keep back. There is no restrictions, but we can be in church. If you didn't do it as yet, click that share button and share this message as well. So for the people who would not have been in church tonight, they can receive the message of Jesus Christ straight to their homes and they can be blessed by God's word. So once you've done that, let's get ready to go into God's word this evening. And I want you to grab your Bible and turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 16 verses 25 to verses 33 all right so acts chapter 16 verses 25 to verses 33 last week the, the sermon that we spoke on was entitled i'm ready to die and i'm ready to live and when i was doing the introduction for that sermon last week i mistakenly said to you all that this is the first message in our series that we are starting a new series but in actuality, I had no intention of doing a sermon series surrounding Paul in prison or, or being in prison. I was, my intention was just to do one sermon alone entitled, I'm ready to die and I'm ready to live. But God has a beautiful way of taking our mistakes and turning it into a message, right? And now going into the second week, I'm officially saying this is a new series that we're in. And I'm officially going to be giving the series a title because last week we didn't have a series title. We just said that the sermon for that message was I'm ready to die and I'm ready to live. So last week message, this week message and the weeks to come will be a series sermon entitled Prison Diaries. All right, Prison Diaries. And we're going to look at the life of Paul in prison. We're going to look at the life of other persons in the Old Testament as well when they were in prison and what they did and we're going to learn some facts we're going to also learn some spiritual truths that will guide us like we said last week right now this pandemic and the lockdown that we're experiencing in Trinidad and Tobago in the month of June it can feel like a prison it can feel like we are closed in and that we're restricted in so many ways and of course most of us would love to get back to normal but we can't right now and that being said, we're continuing in this series entitled Prison Diaries. And we're looking at Acts chapter 16. Here, Paul goes to prison. Again, <laughs> Paul goes to prison. And actually, this would be the first time that he spends time in prison. Last week, we spoke from the book of Philippians when he wrote to them from in prison and he gave them instructions on how he was dealing and how they should continue on as a church. Here we're actually going to see when the church in Philippi was initially started. So we're coming full circle. Last week we saw his letters to the Philippian church. Now we're coming back to when he just started the church in Philippi. And that was the first time he went into prison, just at the beginning of the church in Philippi. So we see here, we're jumping in at verse 25. It says, At midnight Paul and Silas were praising and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Now, how did Paul and Silas end up in prison? Let me give you some background. Paul and Silas was in Philippi and they were preaching. And they were preaching about Jesus. While there, there was a young girl who was a slave. And she had a spirit of divination. 
And while Paul and Silas was going about preaching, she was following them and mocking them and shouting out, you are preaching about the Son of God. And what she was saying was true. They were preaching about Jesus. However, that was attracting unwanted attention because the Romans would not have wanted him preaching this message of Jesus. Now, because of this, Paul got a little bit annoyed by this demonic spirit that was following them around. And he turned one day to the, the girl and cast out the demonic spirit. When he did that, the demonic spirit left immediately. And the masters, the persons that owned this girl, they were very angry. Because this girl, her demonic spirit that was in her was used for fortune telling. And that brought these men, her masters, a lot of money. So because Paul and Silas basically cut off their supply of money from selling um, prophecies through this demonic spirit, they got angry and they brought Paul and Silas before the governors at that time. And they told them that they were preaching message that was, um, that was against Roman belief, which it was against what the Romans believed. Because of that now, Paul and Silas were beaten in public and they were then cast into prison. And in prison, they told the jailers, do not let these two men escape at all. And because of that, the jailer who was in charge of them put Paul and Silas in the inner room of the prison and chained their feet. Imagine, these men aren't, aren't murderers, they aren't thieves, they aren't, they aren't any big time crooks, but they are placed in the inner part of the prison. That means the most secure part of the prison, the hardest part to escape from, and they are placed in shackles. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners was listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison door open, supposing that the prisoners had left, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm. For we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. This is the jailer. And he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Paul and Silas said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household shall be saved. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his family were baptized. You know, during this time being in lockdown, for most of you who are at home, the question that you might be asking every day when you wake up is, what should I do today? What to do? What do I do in this pandemic? I know for a lot of us, I mean, I as well, I tend to do this, but I tend to take my chores from today and postpone some of it for tomorrow so that I would have a little bit of, 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 of activities to do the next day. I don't know if anybody tend to do that as well. You know, even um, right now, you, you probably have, you've probably already binge watched every series, every movie, and you're wondering what, what to do, what to do in this pandemic. And from Paul and Silas, I'm going to show you some truths from the Bible of what they did in prison. And like I said, we're drawing this analogy that in prison is similar to our pandemic condition. So let's see what Paul and Silas does in prison, right? So they're in prison. They've been chained. They've been beaten. They've been beaten so badly their entire body is hurting. And maybe you've, you're in that same place where you are physically hurting or you're emotionally hurting or mentally hurting right now. But they were in great pain while in prison. They were chained by the feet. Imagine they are so beaten and bruised. They couldn't really do much, but yet they still were chained by the feet. They couldn't even move as freely as they wanted in the prison that they're in. I wonder if there's any one of us that even though we're in lockdown, we still are re even more restrained. Maybe you're in lockdown and you're in an apartment renting, so you can't go outside or you can't move about or you can't listen to music as loudly as you would like to or, or listen, to, um, listen to a sermon as loudly as you'd like to. Maybe you're in a home where 
you have family members that are not as supportive of your faith. So even in restriction, you are even more confined and chained like Paul and Silas was. And I have to raise my volume a little bit more because the rain is coming on extremely loudly where I'm at. Maybe it's falling by you as well. So they were in prison, but I want you to look at verse 25, right? It says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. The first thing that I want you to note that Paul and Silas did in prison was that they praised God. They praised God. And why is that so important? Look at what 20, verse 25 says. It says that while they were praying and praising God, that the prisoners were listening to them. I want you to write this down this evening. When you pray and praise in prison, people stop and pay attention. Let me repeat that. When you pray and praise in prison, people stop and pay attention. The other prisoners began to listen at Paul and Silas while they were praying and praising. Because while they were bruised, while they were hurt, while they were chained, while they were restricted, they still praised God. And I know it's cliche, but no restriction and no lockdown can stop your prayers. No lockdown can stop your praise. You have freedom to worship God. And even though they were chained and in prison, they lifted up in a time of praise and worship. They honored God and say, God, we bless your holy name. And because of them praying and praising God, everyone else stopped what they were doing. Uh, I imagine they didn't have much to do. They were in prison and they listened to Paul and Silas. They paid attention to them. And I want you to know this evening for the parents that are joining on, when you praise and pray in a pandemic, your children will stop and pay attention to you. I want all the business owners to know this this evening. When you praise and pray in a pandemic, your employers will stop and pay attention to you. I said the wrong thing, employees, right? Not employers. But it can work the both ways. Maybe you have people higher up in your organization. For those that are leaders in your community, when you pray and praise in a pandemic, people will stop and pay attention to you. And they are stopping and paying attention to you. Because you are doing something that is impactful in their lives. You are, ch you are turning away from fear and choosing to grab hold of faith. You are choosing that even though you're in prison, you will turn your face to God. And when you do that, people stop and they listen. Parents, when you do that, your kids will stop and say, something is different. There is a true and genuine relationship that my mom and my dad, they have with God. People will look at you and say, something is different. How could they pray? How could they praise when they're in pain, when they're in prison? It must be because the God that they serve. It must be because the God that they are praying to, the God that they are praising is real and they have a genuine connection with this God. So the prisoners stopped and they all paid attention. But my first point isn't prayer and praise. My first point is praise. Because the reality is anyone can pray. As a matter of fact, Almost everyone right now is praying. People are praying to their gods. People are praying to multiple gods. People are praying to the universe. People are praying to the sun and the moon. People are praying to the government. People are praying to celebrities. People are even praying to Satan. People are praying. Anyone can pray. Anyone can talk and say, whoever is out there, if there is a God that exists, help us. We need help. But only a child of God can praise in a pandemic. Let me repeat that. Anyone can pray in a pandemic, but only a child of God, only a follower of Jesus, only someone that knows God 
can praise in a pandemic. If you want to see who is really a follower of Jesus, look for the people that are still grateful, who are lifting their hands and saying, God, I bless your name, who still have joy in their life, who still have peace in their life, who still have love and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and long-suffering evident in their life, who still have the fruit of the Spirit in their life, because it's the people that can praise in a pandemic are the people who really know God. Do you know your God? If you know who your God is, you will be like David and you will say, God, your loving kindness is better than life. I will bless your name. Like Paul said last week, I'm ready to die and I'm ready to live. It doesn't matter how this turn out. I don't need the best home. I don't need the best environment. I don't need the big paycheck. I don't need to go running around the savannah and have that free fresh air. All I need is Jesus. And because I got God, I got something to be thankful for. Because God is in my life, I will praise God. Yes, I might be in prison, but that can't stop my praise because I have a real relationship with God. I truly love God because God loved me first. He's done so much for me. He's done so much miracles. And even if he does nothing else, I will still praise him because he is God and he sits on the throne. Will you praise God when there is no benefits? Will you praise God when you are chained down? Will you praise God when there is nothing to gain? That's the true determination of Paul and Silas and of you and I. What to do? Praise God. Praise God. And I know it's difficult at times to praise God because our emotions can get the better of us. I love what David says. David commands his soul and says, soul, I will magnify God. And sometimes you got to look yourself in the mirror and you got to say, hey, you, yes, you. I know it's difficult. I know it's tough, but you are going to praise God. You're going to grab your Bible. You're going to open it. And you're going to read God's word. You're going to join on to church online. You're going to stand up and lift your voice and praise God. It might seem silly, but you're serving God. And you, I am going to praise God in this season. Sometimes you got to look yourself in the mirror and say, I am going to praise God because he is worthy of my praise. So they praised in prison. They praised in prison. And let me take it one step further, right? Only people of God will post about God in a pandemic. Because right now my timeline is flooded with news of the increased cases of COVID-19, with the increased lockdown measures. It's flooded with all the things that would continue to instigate fear and that will continue to put people in a place of hopelessness. But it's only people of God that will continue to post, hey, Jesus Christ loves you. Hey, there is hope. Hey, there is eternity in heaven. Hey, there will be brighter days ahead. Hey, there will be change. Hey, we will make it out of this pandemic. Only people of God will really declare who God is. And they praised God at midnight. And the Bible said, suddenly there was an earthquake. There was a shaking. And not just any earthquake, but a great earthquake. And this earthquake caused all the prison doors to pop open and all the chains to fall off their feet. And maybe some prisoners, they were chained by their hands as well. And I remember when I was in high school, there was an earthquake that happened in Trinidad. And this was my first distinct memory of, what, of an earthquake being a young, a young man. And I'm sure that many of us may have, ex those that are a little bit older may have experienced more earthquakes in their lifetime. But this was my first distinct memory when I was in high school, somewhere around 2007, 2006, somewhere around that time. And when the earthquake occurred, I remember that our, our teacher was telling us to go under the tables and stay there because that's the best place to be and that's the safest place to be. But I was going to all boys school and, you know, Teenagers, they can be a little bit rebellious. When the place started shaking, everyone got up and ran out from the classroom in chaos and stood outside in the open air, into the open space, right? Into the, there's a, a green area with grass that they just stood there. 
And it reminded me when reading this passage that an earthquake brings chaos, not comfort. Earthquakes tend to bring chaos and not comfort. And in this moment, this earthquake brought chaos for the prisoners that was there because they would have been fearful for their own life with this great shaking, this great earthquake. This earthquake brought chaos for the jailer because when he woke up, he saw all the prison doors open and he saw all the chains had fell off the prisoners. And it brought chaos into his heart because he thought in that moment that he would been, he'd have been executed for not being able to guard the prisoners. After all, he was sleeping while he was supposed to be watching them. And he, he, drew, he drew his sword in that moment and he took this sword and he was about to kill himself. And right when he was about to kill himself in the middle of the chaos, Paul and Silas brings comfort by shouting out to the jailer, do not harm yourself, we are all in here. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why is it that all the prisoners are still in prison? I, I don't know if I watched too much prison break when I was younger, right? But I thought that when you get the opportunity to escape from prison, what you do is escape from prison, right? I mean, as a prisoner, all you think about day and night is, how am I going to get out of this prison? How am I going to escape this prison? And you're telling me that the prison doors are open. You're telling me that the chains have fell off the prisoners. And somehow the prisoners are still in prison. That doesn't make sense to me. And I read these verses over and over, trying to figure out why is it that these prisoners stayed? Why is it that they didn't leave? Yes, they were maybe a little bit scared because of the chaos of the earthquake. But after the earthquake stopped, they could have ran out. They could have, the, it was one jailer and a few of them, definitely they would have been able to overpower the jailer if it was the jailer that was standing in their way. He already assumed that they left. Why did they stay in prison? And as I read these verse, over, verses over and over, I came to the conclusion that while the earthquake brought chaos, Paul and Silas had the comforter. Who is the comforter? The comforter is the Holy Spirit. And the only logical explanation for prisoners staying in prison is because Paul and Silas, by praising previously, welcomed the Holy Spirit into that prison and it was the Holy Spirit that kept them in prison and it was because of the Holy Spirit in prison they were persuaded to stay in their cells. I couldn't find any other logical explanation. As a matter of fact scripture doesn't say that Paul and Silas told them you all should stay in prison but instead they stayed because they were persuaded by the power of the Holy Spirit and when you praise God in prison, when you invite the comforter the holy spirit into your home in this pandemic the holy spirit will persuade you to have a sound mind and peace the holy spirit will persuade those around you to do the right thing when the right thing seems difficult the holy spirit will persuade those in your community to love each other and help each other the holy spirit will persuade the criminal elements to turn away from your home and to not come nigh your dwelling this is the holy Holy Spirit that is there with you right now in this pandemic and they praised and they were able to persuade the prisoners to stay in prison to stay in prison but why did Paul and Silas stay in prison because isn't it that God sent the earthquake so that they could be set free from prison so why is it that Paul and Silas is still in prison this, this is a little bit confusing to me. And I have a dog at home. He lives in a, a kennel that we, we would have built for him. And the back of our, this dog kennel, it's made out of uh, wire. And the wire had rusted over time. And there is a hole maybe twice the size of our dog in this dog kennel. But somehow this dog refuses to escape through this hole. And the only time that dog would leave the kennel is if we open the front door, we open the gate, then he would exit the kennel. I don't know if it's because he's well trained or if he's really stupid, right? I'm not sure. But this kind of brought some insight into me, into why Paul and Silas stayed in prison. 
Because at no point in scripture does it say that God sent the earthquake to set them free. You see, for most of us, the earthquake would have seemed as a way of escape. But for Paul and Silas, they understood that this was not God's path for them. This wasn't God's path for them. And that for me is a little bit confusing. How did they know that this wasn't what God's path for them? How did they know that the earthquake wasn't sent by God as a way of escape for them? And maybe right now in this pandemic, you're wondering as well, what is God's path for me? Maybe opportunities are opening up in your life, just like for Paul and Silas, opportunities opened up for them to escape, for them to leave this pandemic. And maybe for you, there are opportunities opening up and it might seem like the obvious route, like the, the doors being open, the shackles falling off, seems like the obvious route, like this must be God. This must be what God wants for me. But Paul and Silas knew that this wasn't the part of God for their life. Because they understood that God is just. I want to just dwell on this just for a little bit, right? God is just. That means that two wrongs doesn't make a right. Yes, they were wrongfully imprisoned. And by all means, they should escape. Because it was the right thing in an earthly perspective that they were wrongfully placed in prison. So if they fled, if they left the prison outside of the law, that that was fine. But if they left that prison and they escaped, they would have been refugees and not free men. And we need to understand that when it comes for, to God's part for our life, God's part for our life is always just. Because God is just. So that means that when you are pondering which part to take, you need to ask yourself, does this part align with the principles of God's word? Because two wrongs don't make a right. So even in prison, you still have to do the right thing, which is stay in prison because you've been condemned to prison until the law sets you free. And even in a pandemic, it means that stealing is still wrong. Even in a pandemic, it means that lying is still wrong. Even a pandemic, it means that gambling is still wrong. What am I saying? I'm saying that there might be opportunities that present itself to you right now as a way to earn income, as a way to provide it for your family, as a way to stay sane in this um, pandemic. And it may present itself to you as maybe it's God. It's an earthquake. It's an obvious opportunity. But God's part for your life is always just. God's part for your life is always the right way. So Paul and Silas stayed inside the prison cell because they understood this wasn't God's part. Even though it was something supernatural like an earthquake, maybe it might be somebody coming and telling you a, a, a prophecy, selling you prophecy that it isn't God's part for your life. And you need to examine, step back and say, hey, you know what? This isn't right. I can't gain success by bribing people. I can't gain success by lying on my resume. I can't gain an income right now through pyramid schemes. I know pyramid schemes kind of crashed and failed over the last few months. But this isn't the right part. And I, for, would you believe this? Like my entire life, I have never won a raffle. Like I've never won any sort of competition where you enter your name and you're randomly selected. I've gone to many um, events and I've never won a hot seat. I've never won a door prize. Like, I, I don't know what about it that I don't win at these types of events. Even on Facebook, like if I share a post that says, you know, share this post and you win a free TV, I don't ever win, right? And I'm not saying that that is a bad thing if you do win a prize. My sister tends to win all these prizes, so maybe something is wrong with her, right? But um, what I'm saying is that when it comes to the easy way out, not every opportunity that it presents itself is a God opportunity. And we need to be very sensitive right now, especially right now. Because it's in this time that many false Christs would rise up. Many false preachers, many false doctrines. It's in this time that many people will try to sway you into things that seem right, that seems like God, but it's not God. I'm reminded of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It seemed like eating the apple would have been okay, but it wasn't God. 
And we need to remind ourselves that if it doesn't match up to God's word, it's not God. If it doesn't match to God's word, it's not God. Even if it sounds close to it, if it's very similar, as a matter of fact, it could even be exact words to one passage of verse of scripture. But if that verse is taken out of context, then it's not God. How do you know if it's out of context? Well, go to the passage of scripture and read the verse before, read the verse after, and you'll get context to what that verse means. Because plenty would come with you with one verse, nitpick, pulled out, that is taken out of context. And I don't want you to take the wrong part in this pandemic because it seems like the obvious part and it seems like God's doing it when it's not God. I don't know what would have happened to Paul and Silas if they ran out of prison and said, hey, this is God. This is the way of escape. Maybe they might have been killed and executed the next time that they were found in Rome. And that would have been detrimental because all the ministry that Paul would have done in establishing the churches in Rome would have been put to a halt because they thought this was God's way when it was not. So stop and stay. Maybe you need to stay indoors a little bit longer. Maybe you need to stay locked down a little bit longer because it isn't God's way. And I tend to tell people, I'm, I'm, I'm t I've been telling a couple of people this recently and I've been thinking this to myself as well. And this is not, this is not going against the governance of our land. This is not being rebellious. But just because the Prime Minister reopens churches doesn't mean that I'm going to reopen our church if it's not safe for us to gather together again. Because we need to make sure that we are choosing God's part. Even though it might seem as though finally we can come out of prison, this is the way, now is the time, we still need to examine God's word and use wisdom in our decisions. So just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. Paul says that just because I have liberty doesn't mean that I go about doing whatever I want to do, but I still restrain in certain seasons. So God's way is always just. This was his part. Paul and Silas remained in prison. And what most would see as a way of escape, Paul and Silas saw as a way to evangelize. And they said to the jailer, hey, come here. Don't kill yourself. Don't harm yourself. We are still alive. And the jailer comes running to Paul and Silas. And he says to them, sirs, what shall I do to be saved? Now, I'm not sure if the, if the jailer was speaking about salvation from the Roman rulers that would have executed him. If he was speaking about salvation from the prisoners that might have wanted to kill him. But he asked to be saved. And whichever one he was speaking about, the answer that Paul and Silas gives is still valid and is still true. He, they say to him, all you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine, they take the whole 66 books of the Bible, sum it up into one word, believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that in that moment, the jailer receives Jesus and is saved, and his household as well are baptized in that moment. And Paul and Silas saw this as an opportunity to preach. Because even in prison, we have to continue preaching. And I've been saying this almost every week that we've had service. Because I don't want you to forget it. And I don't want you to overlook it. That you still are called to preach in this season. You're still called to tell people about Jesus in this season. And I know that in prison it seems as though there is less opportunity. But maybe the opportunities aren't as obvious as you would like them to be. But the opportunities are there. The opportunities are there. And you just have to look for them. You just have to ask God, God, show me who to preach to. God, show me how can I share the good news of Jesus Christ. God, show me what to tell me what to tell people. And if you don't know what to say, hey, this is the most simple gospel message that you would read. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And Paul and Silas preached to the jailer. And if you have a New, J New King James translation that you are reading from right now, you may see on the title of this paragraph that we are reading, you may see the title, The Philippian Jailer is Saved. 
the Philippian jailer is saved. Why was Paul and Silas in Philippi? They were there to save people because they had started a ministry in Philippi. And I would like to believe that this jailer and his family would have been the elders in the church 10 years later when Paul was writing to the Philippians while he was in prison. I would like to believe that this jailer and his family would have been some of the founding members of the church in Philippi. I don't know for certain, but I'd like to imagine that because of them preaching to this jailer while in prison, that he and his family went on to preach to all the areas of Philippi and carry this message on. Because Paul and Silas didn't save everyone that was in Philippi, but they passed on the message to those that were there and they passed it on to others. And when you preach to one person, that one person will preach to one person. And when you preach to that one person, they will preach to another person and another person and another person and before you know it the entire nation of philippi the entire nation of trinidad and tobago would have received salvation through jesus christ and say jesus you are lord and savior of my life what does he say just believe in the lord jesus and you and your family shall be saved paul and silas that night goes to the philippians jailer's house the Philippian jailer treats them of their wounds, washes them of their bruises, and he then feeds Paul and Silas together with his family. As this story would conclude, the next day, the Roman governance sends letter to the jailer saying that you can release Paul and Silas, but do it privately. <laughs> Paul, Paul being Paul, only Paul would do something like this. He says to them, I am not going privately. You beat me publicly. You shamed me publicly. And I am a Roman citizen. I want you to let, release me from prison publicly. Let everyone see that I was innocent. And when they heard that he was a Roman citizen, they trembled in fear. Because all this time they thought he was a Jew. They didn't know that he was Roman as well. That meant that he was a citizen of Rome and they would have abused their own citizen. And we would be familiar with this, the, this concept when it comes to immigrants and when it comes to legal citizens. So if Paul was a visitor, it would have seemed somehow justified that as a Jew, they would have treated him like this. But now knowing that he was one of them in terms of a citizen of Rome, it brought fear into their hearts and they released him publicly. And the gospel of Jesus Christ continued to flourish in Philippi. What do you do in prison? What do you do in a pandemic? You praise God. You persuade people. You preach Jesus. And you follow the path of God. This is what you do in prison. And as I close this evening, if you're saying, well, I want to know this Jesus, like the Philippian jailer, you're saying, how do I, how do I, how do I receive salvation? How am I saved? Then just as Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer, I want to say to you this evening, all you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household shall be saved. So if tonight you're saying, yes, I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for me. That three days later, he rose from the grave so that I can have life and have it more abundantly. Then I want to invite you at this time to stand, stop whatever you're doing, close your eyes and place your hand on your heart. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And as you pray, you're going to invite Jesus into your life to be Lord of your life and say, Jesus, I believe. So let us pray tonight. Heavenly Father, tonight, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe that Jesus died for me. And three days later, he rose from the grave. I believe that God loves me. I believe that I am forgiven through Christ Jesus. So I confess that I am a sinner and I ask God to forgive me of my sins. I commit from this day forward to serving Jesus as I've invited him into my heart tonight as Lord and Savior of my life. I ask this prayer 
In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, then the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, has now come into your heart and filled your vessel. Now God is with you. He will never leave you. Neither will he ever forsake you. And Jesus died for you and I. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus established something known as communion. It was the night before he would have been executed, the night of his arrest. He had the last supper with his disciples where he gathered them together and they all broke bread together and they drank wine together. And he said to them, do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And this being the first Saturday of, in June, we want to have communion to remember what God has done for us. To remember that Jesus died for us. And I know you've guarded your bread and your wine. And, you know, I said to you, even if you have water, you can use that. Because in all honesty, it doesn't really matter what you use. It doesn't matter what type of juice you have. It doesn't matter what type of bread you have. You could be eating conkles, as a matter of fact. It doesn't matter, right? Because these emblems, they are there to remind us. You see, we are human and we live in a physical realm. And we need something physical at times. We need to do something physically to be reminded of Jesus. Because if we don't do this, we tend to forget what Jesus has done for us. We, our minds aren't so focused on communion. People are most attentive to the message of Jesus Christ because they are focused on the cross and what Jesus did. And that's the purpose of this wine and this, this bread is just there for you to remember that Jesus died for you. The bread and the wine has no power on its own. What Jesus did on the cross has that power. And we do this in remembrance to stir up our faith. And by activating our faith, Yes, power is able to flow. Healing is able to flow. All right? So if you haven't done it as yet, have your glass of wine and your bread close by in hand. All right? And let's get prepared to partake in communion this evening. And communion is a time where we draw closer to God by reading His Word and by setting our hearts on heaven. So I want you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians as we prepare to have communion. We're reading from chapter 11, verses 27 to 31. And then we're going to go back a couple of verses to verse 23 to 26. All right, so let's begin at verse 27. It says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks is an, in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are sick among you. For, if, uh, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. All right, so I'll stop reading at that verse there in verse 30. And all this words in this all these words are saying all that paul is saying is to take a moment and examine yourself and ensure that you are in right standing with god what does that mean ensure that you are in relationship with god that you have given your heart to god and that his spirit lives inside of you and if that is not the case right now then as you sit back and examine yourself then it's an awesome time to say jesus forgive me of my sins make me a new creature in christ jesus Set my spirit in right standing with you and Holy Spirit come and live inside of me. If you're not willing to do that at this moment, then as Paul would say here, don't take communion because you would cause Dalmatian to your own self because you eat and drink unwillingly, un unworthily. And that is why so many are sick in the body and even die. All right. So once you've done that, we're going to now proceed to the actual communion part where we go to verse 23. And I want you to grab your bread and your wine and hold it in your hand. And as you hold these emblems in your hand, let's just take a moment to bless it in prayer and then we'll partake. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for Jesus dying for us. We thank you, God, that Jesus shed his blood for our redemption. In this moment, we bless the bread that we hold in our hand that represents your body. 
and we bless this wine that we hold in our hand that represents your blood. As we partake of this bread and this wine in remembrance of your sacrifice, let it, O oh God, let it, O oh God, stir up our faith in this moment so that we can challenge you for greater things. We can challenge you for miracles in our life. We can challenge you, God, for strength in this pandemic because of faith being stirred up by us remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you hold the bread in your hand, in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, which we just did, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat this. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At this time, let us eat of the bread in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 25, it says, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, and blood must be shed for a covenant to be made. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. The old covenant was that the blood of goat and sheep would forgive us of our sins. The new covenant is that the grace of God, through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, was a one-time sacrifice for the remission, the forgiveness of our sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. At this time, let us now drink in remembrance of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Why not take a moment to lift your hand and to just give God praise as you remember what Jesus did for you. As you remember that he took 39 stripes for you. He was bruised. He was beaten for you. As you remember that he walked all the way up Calvary's hill with a cross on his back. He carried that cross. He fell down many times. But he got back up because he had a mission which was to save you. And he made his way all the way to the top of that hill. And at that point, they nailed him by his hands by his feet, the nails pierced into his body and they placed a crown of thorn on his head. And then they lifted up his body on that cross and he laid there for hours, gasping for breath in pain so that you can have purpose. And he cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And in his last breath, he said, it is finished. I've accomplished the mission of saving this entire world. Take your hands, lift it to heaven, lift your voice, say, God, we honor you. We bless your name. We thank you for the cross. We remember what Jesus did for us. We are forever grateful. God, even though we're in a pandemic, we can praise you because we have a true relationship with God. We thank you, God, for your loving kindness. We thank you for your mercies and forgiveness. God, in this moment, as our faith has been stirred up, we ask, God, for if there be any that are sick in body, that by your stripes they shall be made well in the name of Jesus. Those that may be suffering, God, from mental sickness, those that may be suffering, God, from physical ailment, whether it be pain in their body, whether it be heart conditions, lung conditions, kidney conditions, God, whatever it may be, God, bone marrow conditions, God, let there be healing now in the name of Jesus Christ. Those that may have contracted the COVID-19 virus, God, we ask for healing now in the name of Jesus, for no form of sickness, no manner of sickness is beyond your power and your ability, God. You are a miracle working God and you are able to do the impossible. So let healing flow, God, in families that may be broken now, in fathers and mothers that may have been separated in parents that may have not seen their children in a long time, in brothers and sisters that may have had quarrels and disputes that have broken families apart. Let healing flow now in the name of Jesus. Those that may be broken from addiction, God, and, and vices, let healing flow now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, as your one-time sacrifice on the cross has bring wholeness in our body, for you were broken so that we can be made whole. Your blood 
blood was shed, God, on the cross so that we can have salvation. How can we be saved? By believing in Jesus Christ. And we believe, God. We have faith. We believe that you are able now to bring miracles and healing and deliverance to your people in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to take a moment to just give God praise, to just say, God, we bless your name. We thank you, God, for doing these miracles in our life. We thank you, God, so for sending your son Jesus to die for us. We thank you, God, that our home is in heaven. We thank you, God, that we have an eternity to look forward to. We bless your holy name in Jesus' name. We, with thanksgiving, we give God praise tonight. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love communion. I love to remember what Jesus has done for us. Sometimes when I'm thinking about communion, I tend to have clips of Passion of the Christ running in my, in my mind. And that kind of brings a, a, a physical uh, representation to the crucifixion that we can remember what Jesus did for us. And the sacrifice that he made for us was definitely a sacrifice that no man would do. No man would do. Uh, the Bible tells us that what greater love is there than a man would lay down his life for us. And many people would say, yeah, I'm ready to die for you. But hey, only Jesus actually died for you. All right. And remember that he died for you because he loves you. And if you're not sure what to do in this pandemic, like we covered in our sermon, praise God, persuade others, follow God's path and preach and keep on preaching about Jesus. I pray that you were blessed tonight. We continue next Saturday with our live stream at 6.30 p.m. We also have our Bible study. We're studying the book of 1 Timothy. So we'll finish 1 Corinthians. We're on to 1 Timothy. So read up into 1 Timothy. I was going to tell you read the first five chapters, but you might run into some problems there. So read up into the book of 1 Timothy, and then let's go into our Bible study on Monday. On Wednesday, we have our prayer meeting. And at the end of this stream, you'll see some more information on how you can stay connected with us. Uh, please continue to stay connected. Send us messages. Call us. Uh, we, we are here for you in this season. We're here to help you in whatever way that we can. If you committed to following Jesus today for the first time, please send us a message or give me a call. My number is 7665959 so that we can pray for you and we can help you in this journey of following Jesus. We love you and we care for you. And we want us all to make it out of this prison, this pandemic, with purpose, with power, and to be able to really propel forward into all that God has called us to. So enjoy the rest of your night. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Stay connected with our church. And we are so glad that you joined on tonight. If you didn't do it as yet, hit that share button so that someone that you care about can be blessed by the sermon. God bless you. God keep you. May his favor shine upon you. May his hand be upon your life. I bless you all now in Jesus' name. Amen.